Previously on the all new adventures of the Doctor Who Book Club podcast. Uh, ninth Doctor book. Mm. I've only read one ninth Doctor book and uh, yeah. We don't have a lot to choose from. There were (laughs) (laughs) uh, the six novels. I decided to go with Only Human by Gareth Roberts. Cool. Okay. I've enjoyed Gareth Roberts' take on the Fourth Doctor and Romana, so it be interesting to see how he captures uh, Jack, Rose, and the Doctor together. Yes, it will be good, uh, I hope. Because uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not as much of a fan as you are of, um, of Gareth Roberts' Fourth Doctor books. Um, mm. But uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. And now our story continues. Adventures of the Doctor Who Book Club podcast. This is Matt in Minnesota. Chris in South London, not far from Bromley, of which more later. <laughs> the um, the clocks have changed, and uh, it's it's not going to be pitch dark on my uh, on my journey home from work, which is which is nice. Yeah, how are you? How are things? Good. I'm uh, glad spring is here and excited for all the snow to finish melting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is it, is, it still, is it still going? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, gosh. We had another visit of the beast from the east, as the uh, the press are calling it in a way that sounds slightly xenophobic. Uh, but, you know, that's the British press for you. Uh, referring to the snowstorms we've been getting from um, from Russia. And like, that's not the worst things we've been having from Russia of late. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi Putin if you're listening and I was kind of driving around over the last week and uh, you could still see there was still some snow melting in some parts of the UK it was parts of southern England on uh, on Friday and just like wow it did its heaviest snowing the previous weekend so Britain grinds to a halt as we said on the previous show whereas places that uh, that are used to the idea of being sort of like northern hemisphere countries <laughs> not particularly close to the equator uh, can cope with the snow but uh, you yeah, know we can't mm. and only seven months away from new doctor who yes this is true this is true shall we go on to uh, to show and tell sounds great do you wish to uh kick us off yeah um for a show and tell uh this month i wanted to talk about uh two big finish audios that i listened to a couple weeks ago now these would be voyage to venus and voyage to the new world they were so we say heavily discounted by Mm -hmm. uh, a recent big finish sale but um it was the first uh jago and lightfoot stories i listened to and it had them in a pair of uh tales encountering the sixth doctor Mm. They were just a lot of fun and very reminiscent of that Jules Verne, H.G. Uh, Wells sort of time period. It felt very uh, steampunky and mm. Voyage to Venus. I, <laughs> I was getting a little uh, upset listening to it because there were some major continuity errors, but in terms of like <laughs> the Venusian <laughs> history and timeline, but they were all sorted out very cleverly and were actually part of the plot. Oh, so okay. it's good to know going in for that one. And then the... Uh, <laughs> Second one was a uh, historical set with the uh, Lost Roanoke Colony mm. in Virginia, which was also pretty cool. I think I've heard that one, yeah. Or at least I've heard a sampler, I and mean, I remember very much enjoying it. Listeners, uh, if you're interested in either Jago and Lightfoot, steampunk Victorian era sci-fi, and or uh, are fans of The Sixth Doctor, I, I would recommend these two. And they also did have the Mahogany Murders on um, a very cheap discount um uh, a while ago as well i don't know whether that's still on a reduced price uh, which was uh, the first uh, it was almost it was like the pilot to the jago and lightfoot big finish series and that's a very enjoyable listen was that part of the uh companion companion yeah okay. it was it was it was it's very good cool so what do you have for a uh, show and tell right so I, i've i've kind of got two things 
so uh, I'll kind of get the smaller one out of the way. Um, both of these are slightly tenuous and their connections to Doctor Who, but, uh, but anyway, so it was very recently my birthday. Many happy returns. Many thanks. Uh, and um, we went off to Bletchley Park, which is where uh, Alan Turing and various other fantastic minds in the Second World War um, worked to um, kind of crack the Enigma code as well as other machines and sort of if not quite invented, uh, modern computer science sort of went a long way towards. Um, and yeah, it's a fabulous place to go. Also, on that morning, I'd been given a copy of uh, Neil Gaiman's um, uh, Norse mythology book. Uh, and so I kind of thought, I'm having a curse of Fenric birthday. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah yeah so and because that's probably my favorite of the classic stories uh so uh, yes yes it was it was it was nice having a accidentally curse of fenric themed birthday uh, there were no hemavirs uh, hanging around but there was a member of the royal family the duke of kent uh don't, yeah, don't worry you shouldn't have heard of him um was uh, opening up an exhibition but yeah um but bletchley bletchley park if if ever if anybody finds themselves in, in kind of like you know Oxfordshire or uh, that part of, of of England, it is very worth your time, and uh, you don't have to be particularly into computing. I think they do a very good job of explaining the difficulty of the problems in in terms that um, laypersons can understand. It's really brilliant and it's just very moving as well being in Turing's office and just thinking as well as to how horrifically Britain treated him. Um, mm. It was, it was, yeah, it was, it was quite poignant. He was also a Doctor Who character too, as well, right? The uh, yes, the Turing yeah. Test uh, yes. novel. Yeah, yes. So, uh, so not not quite as tenuous. Of no, a... <laughs> not quite as tenuous. No, no. Um, so, which brings me into my other thing that is uh, also this will involve somebody who has been a character in Doctor Who. Way back when, at my university, Bill Clinton came to give his final speech as president on foreign soil. And so, like, the great and the good of Britain were kind of, like, assembled there. And uh, I, uh, because I was doing some work for the university, managed to get my hands on a ticket. And uh, I was sort of, like, sitting up in the gods, and I was just amazed at all of these famous folk that were all just kind of, like, mingling in front of me. You know, Clinton gave a speech, which, um, you know, was the kind of speech that you sort of, you can give at the end of your presidency when it doesn't really matter. (laughs) So how the world should be different. It was the morning after... The 2000 election had been finally decided. Yeah, uh, there were some kind of comments about that. So we went off to kind of like, there was a reception for the VIPs and it was also like a reception for the students. And so I was there kind of just having food and drink with my fellow students. And then it was, it was a small crowd wandering around. And uh, so I decided to wander over and see um, what was happening. And they were talking to Professor Stephen Hawking. He wasn't with the VIPs. He was just mingling. And uh, I chatted with him. And uh, he was an incredibly kind of like warm and friendly guy. And he was really quite dismissive of the speech as well, kind of like basically saying what I was saying that uh, Bill Clinton had been, um, if he'd said, um, if he'd outlined his vision of the world um, sort of about seven years prior, then might have actually been able to do something. Mm. Um, Yeah, very, very warm and very friendly. I mean, the Doctor Who connection to Stephen Hawking is that uh, he appeared in uh, one of the new adventures. I think he appears in The Dying Days. And uh, he gets mentioned by Mickey as well. And there was a kind of his genre history is more kind of like Simpsons and Star Trek, but uh, about apparently he was a fan of the show. My show and tell was a very tenuous thing, but I just wanted just to kind of pay tribute to a great man who was really struck by the fact that he was kind of hanging out with us. Yeah, that is really cool, and and that you um, had an opportunity to to meet him too. Uh, I mean, I can't say I've ever understood any of his books. I mean, I did try reading. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm not getting this. But, uh, but yeah, yeah, I think I got halfway through the brief history of time and was hoping for something slightly briefer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but no, what a what a fascinating man and just yeah. super intelligent and hmm. really advanced our understanding of you know the frontiers of science and how to think yeah. about different questions that we should be asking. It's just really incredible legacy that he left. So hmm. from. <laughs> <laughs> From there, where should we go? Should we go on to the book for uh... Sure. <laughs> yes. So that brings us to our book selection for the month, which mm. was Only Human by Gareth Roberts. This is a Ninth Doctor, uh, Rose and Jack story, and it was first published in September 2005. So in that three or four month gap where uh, Eccleston series had ended and we were waiting 
or more like a five month gap, um, waiting for the Christmas invasion with David Tennant. And it was published as part of the second set of three uh, Ninth Doctor books. And then it was um, republished in 2013 for the 50th anniversary selection uh, representing the Ninth Doctor era. And I think we touched on last month, there isn't a whole lot to choose from Mm. from the Ninth Doctor era. But uh, one interesting thing that I wanted to mention about the new series adventures, especially in the original kind of hardcover format, I don't know if you noticed or not, but all of the chapters are numbered in Gallifreyan. This may or may not be on the... No, it doesn't Kindle, Kindle version. Yeah. yeah. No. So every chapter uh, has like a symbol. So it'll say like chapter one, but then it'll also have the Gallifrey symbol for the mm. number one. Mm. And if you look at the spines of all of the ninth and tenth Doctor books, they're all numbered in Gallifrey and on the actual spines. Um, mm. And the only way you can decipher which book number it is is by finding the corresponding chapter <laughs> and, and seeing like oh this is you know so this particular book is uh numbered uh book number five yeah. um and i guess that was kind of a helpful trick because uh when these would be published in groups of three you know you wouldn't necessarily know which order of the three to read them in mm. um and it was also the only ninth doctor book not to include a reference to uh bad wolf in it yes i, I find it bizarre because it's presumably it's set after boomtown because because uh, I, I watched boomtown just before recording this and uh, and jack is clearly quite new to the tardis in boomtown and he is he has a conversation with mickey about um the tardis's appearance um in the police box and, yeah, and none of that gets touched upon in this so mm. yeah it, it you kind of i get the impression that you know, it's his trip to cardiff is his first trip in the tardis yeah, I think there might be a bit of a continuity error there mm. because I think in the book he mentions that this is his first time visiting Rose's era. Oh, yeah. So, so it, to me, it would be set right before Boomtown, but I, there's yeah. so many inconsistencies between the two. I don't know that you can necessarily recommend. Yeah, yeah, it's like a Schrodinger's placement. It, <laughs> it, it, it takes place around the time of Boomtown. <laughs> yes. Yeah, because also given how much, because in Boomtown there's that focus on yeah, the fact that Bad Wolf keeps on popping up over everywhere you'd have thought that um that somebody would have said hang on we've not seen any tenuous bad wolf references wolves do get a single reference uh, later yeah. on in the in the book but yeah not in that same context um, no. we should talk a little bit about gareth roberts hmm. uh, he's written three episodes for the rtd era and he's also written three episodes for the moffat era yeah. so for uh rtd he wrote shakespeare code Unicorn and the Wasp, and Planet of the Dead. Mm -hmm. And then for Moffat, he wrote uh, The Lodger, Closing Time, and The Caretaker. And he's also written nine stories, so 18 episodes of uh, The Sarah Jane Adventures. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he wrote for Torchwood or not. I don't remember, no. And he also wrote um, Attack of the Grask, which was like the uh, interactive red button adventure with the uh, 10th Doctor. And then he's written a number of comics for DWM. Mm-hmm. And then um, two big finish audios with Clayton Hickman, uh, both with Mel, and both uh, extremely funny. Um, I've, mm. I've heard both of them. Uh, the One Doctor with the Sixth Doctor and Mel, and then Bang Bang a Boom, which is a spoof of uh, Deep Space Nine, Babylon 5, and Eurovision. <laughs> <laughs> All rolled into one with the uh, Seventh Doctor and Mel, and that one's pretty fun. He certainly brings a comedy, I mean, and... Uh, and- and that's definitely true of the various new adventures that he's written as well and uh, and and sort of missing adventures and and as we touched upon sort of last time in, in book format uh the tardis crew that you most associate him with is probably you know, the um, fourth doctor and second romana and canine his doctor who credentials are in no doubt <laughs> That TARDIS crew combination the fourth doctor romana and, and canine it it feels to me and we can touch on this too later on in in our discussion today, but I think he very much views like the Graham Williams era as kind of the uh, the standard of, mm. of Doctor Who. Some of the characters and descriptions in this book feel right out of seventies. Oh yes, uh, Doctor <laughs> Who. So yes. uh, we kind of get a little bit of that mixing of time frames, like how we talked about last month with like the first Doctor finding himself in a Eric Sayward story. This feels a little bit to me, without spoiling it too much, like uh, the Ninth Doctor, uh, Jack and Rose, maybe have wandered into a Graham Williams era story. Yeah, particularly a Douglas Adams one. Mm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely later uh, Williams. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, should we begin? Sure. 
Right, so the novel begins uh, with a uh, unexpected, um, for me, <laughs> excursion into uh, into an area of London that's quite close to where I live, as I sort of alluded to earlier. Um, Bromley is two boroughs away from uh, where I'm speaking to you. So where I've not been to Bromley, th- th- there are various bits that are quite recognisable. Prior to the Bromley scene, there's a short journal entry with a very mm. disturbed young girl from the far future who is uh, dissecting and putting back together her house cat and enhancing it with different uh, abilities. Mm. And she shows up later. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhat. Uh, so the story begins with a, with a trip to a nightclub. Um, uh, not the Doctor and Rose and Jack, but instead um, just a, kind of a, a couple of characters, um, a, sort of a woman and a man who kind of get into a fight. Is it's a fancy dress night, the nightclub, uh, and uh, certainly um, South London nightclubs are um, not necessarily the most peaceful of places. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I was reading really something. Like, yeah, yeah, because um, Gareth Roberts apparently used to live in Bromley. Uh, and uh, definitely there is a lot of South London in this, certainly in the early parts of the book. So the um, uh, the lady feels that she's been sort of eyed up by um, by a chap dressed as a caveman. So uh, her kind of companion kind of goes and sort of like picks a fight with this bloke. And he sort of says that, you know, he's like really smelly. He's like, he's like, he's homeless and everything. It becomes this kind of, this brawl. And he's sort of like surprised by the strength of the guy that he's fighting turns out that uh, it's the wrong caveman there was a kind of another guy in a kind of like a fairly cheap caveman outfit who's um, kind of got away scot-free whereas the um, you know, the guy that he's beating uh, and being beaten by ends up kind of being taken to a hospital and uh, yeah it's a kind of a, a slightly <laughs> unexpected <laughs> beginning and we've also kind of cut back to the um, to the TARDIS and uh, where, where they're kind of talking about uh, their their, their kind of trips to go on a um, excursion to um, planet Kegron Pluva, and this is where um, we'll hear our recording for this week, our reading rather. And our dramatic reading is by uh, Anthony Head. Yes, thank you, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> Who uh, was Giles on Buffy and appeared in uh, School Reunion in Doctor Who, and then was also the villain in uh a four-part Big Finish story called uh, the Excellus uh, Quadrilogy. Mm. And uh, also quite famous in this country for doing the Nescafe ads many years oh. ago. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, audio, by the way, is available on iBooks, Audible, or wherever fine audiobooks are sold. Mm. You were going to love this, Rose, enthused the Doctor as he leapt from panel to panel of the TARDIS console his eyes alight with childish optimism in the reflected green glow of the grinding central column. As always, Rose felt the Doctor's enthusiasm building the same anticipation and excitement in her. She grabbed the edge of the console as the TARDIS gave one of its customary lurches and smiled over at him. Tell me more. The Doctor spun a dial and threw a lever. Kegron Pluva, he announced grandly. OK, mused Rose. That a person or a place, or some sort of oven spray? Planet, the doctor beamed. It's got the maddest ecosystem in the universe. He flung his arms about, demonstrating. You've got six moons going one way, three moons going the other way, and a sun that only orbits the planet. Forty-three seasons in one year. The top life form, a kind of dog-plant fungus thing. Top dog-plant fungus, laughed Rose. Yeah, the doctor nodded. Plus the water's solid. And everyone eats a kind of metal plum. Rose held up a hand. Enough spoilers, just let me see it. She was tingling with pleasure, goosebumps coming up on her arms at the prospect of stepping out from the TARDIS onto this bizarre alien world. I'm really going to regret pointing this out, said a third voice, but does that mean what I think it means? Rose and the Doctor looked up to see Captain Jack, who had joined them in the control room, and was pointing to one of the instruments built into the base of the console a small black box which was emitting a steady, flashing red light. He knelt down and fiddled with some buttons on the box. The doctor joined him and slapped his hand playfully. "'You're still here, then,' he said, shaking his head mock ruefully. "'I've got to remember, put the parental control on.' Rose looked the captain over. He had obviously been plundering the doctor's incredibly extensive wardrobe in the depths of the TARDIS and was wearing an old-fashioned merchant navy outfit in blue serge with white piping. 
Okay, yeah, so the TARDIS has been detecting a temporal distortion, and uh, so somebody appears to have travelled to early 21st century Bromley uh, using a dangerous form of time travel called a rip engine. So the TARDIS uh, materialises uh, uh, in a park, and, uh, and the Doctor and Jack go off to try and find a time distortion. I know where Bromley is and everything. I'm not entirely sure to what extent it would be obvious to someone who doesn't know South London that Bromley is actually not its own city. Mm, like it's it's part of part of London. Yeah, it it seemed to me like a like a suburb almost, like a yeah. But there didn't seem to be a lot of things to sort of say we're in South London. Mm. At least not as much as I'd kind of like expected, because there's a lot of UK references in this, a lot of UK cultural references. Yeah, and especially uh, 2005 references, too. It, it yes. feels very much of the time, not in a bad way. Mm. One thing I did want to mention is that there are certain turns of phrase that Gareth Roberts used that are just, some of his word choices just really paint just an evocative kind of mental yes. picture. And yeah. I wanted to just take a moment to read his description of the TARDIS materializing, because it's, mm. it's just okay. eloquent. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so here I go. Then in the far corner of the gardens, between a notice board and a dustbin, there came the rasping and grating sound of ancient unearthly engines. A light began to flash illogically in midair. Seconds later, the police box shell of the TARDIS had faded up from transparency. The pigeon scattered. The dog looked over curiously, but a pensioner, who was good as deaf, didn't notice at all. <laughs> he just has, he has the ability to just kind of yeah. paint just a, an image like that so not long after that when um, the doctor and well, and jack are kind of like wandering around kind of like bromley shopping center they talk about the evangelical group trying to wrap people into the arms of jesus uh and i don't know whether those people still operate in bromley but they certainly still operate on the high street near where i live <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> i was like yep you know south london <laughs> too funny <laughs> yeah i think they might have migrated west over the intervening <laughs> decade and a bit so um rose um pops into the local nail salon <laughs> um to try to find information and uh, yeah there's no shortage of those or tanning places <laughs> on my high street uh and uh, so she has a kind of a chat with um with one of the manicurists and uh, finds out that uh, that a bloke um dressed in a caveman was kind of taken to the nearby hospital that's their lead because like the doctor and jack aren't really kind of getting anywhere so the doctor uh, takes the tardis to the hospital and then discovers that the um, that the army's kind of like moved in and uh, they're kind of like evacuating everyone uh, so um, and so they need a distraction so uh, jack um a shy and retiring man um <laughs> could, runs naked <laughs> around the hospital and so uh, doctor and rose are able to kind of like slip in and they kind of find out that the reason why the army are there is because um, this man dressed as a caveman is actually a Neanderthal. Mm, yes. And again, just with Gareth Roberts's mm. prose, there's um, a scene where people are running out of the, the hospital and mm. the doctor stops a cleaning lady uh, and, you know, asks her what what's going on. And, and again, just mm. in a in a sentence, um, Gareth Roberts is able to give this lady, you know, enough background so that you yeah. can fully visualize and realize she's there. I think the phrase he uses is, uh, you know, the cleaning lady with the guilty thrill of being able to share bad news in her eye. <laughs> <laughs> you know, leans over and says, they're evacuating. <laughs> it, just just little moments like that. Yeah. That um, I don't know what it is, but to me, it just it kicks the prose and the narration up a notch from mm. what we've been reading <laughs> lately. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and also as well, uh, same with the hospital. Um, he does make a great pain to talk about how the, um, the hospital is staffed by people from around the world. Um, and sort of like mentions Ukraine and sort of various other kind of like European countries and uh, you know, and you know these people are still the backbone of the NHS um, in, in, in this day and it was it was lovely because like this really did feel like kind of like you know, my London mm. um, so um, yeah because like, I mean I you know, I know people you know, in in my borough you know, who've come there from you know, all over the world it was just really nice nice to see the, this kind of like you know the, the kind of the cultural melting pot being kind of depicted and one of the nurses who i think is an mm. immigrant from poland mm. uh named veronica you get a little bit of backstory about her and kind of you know she's the nurse that's been taking care of this uh neanderthal who was brought in 
you, you do get a, enough of her backstory where she realizes that the Doctor and Rose are something special, and part of her is just screaming to say, please take me with you. Mm, yes. <laughs> but but yeah. she does help out the Doctor and Rose. Uh, she, for some reason, she trusts them versus of the others who are here examining the patient. There's a lot of scientists and, and military folk. The Doctor and Rose managed to wheel uh, the Neanderthal out of the hospital and Veronica's with them and, you know, misdirecting the soldiers mm-hmm. and getting them to, to go elsewhere. And uh, the Doctor and Rose get the Neanderthal into the TARDIS. At that point, the translation circuits kick in and he's able to um, speak. And short kind of aside, I've always been kind of fascinated by Neanderthals and mm. their their history and, you know, the possible theories as to how they died out and, and all yeah. of that. And Gareth Roberts gets a lot of the details right with this, mm. uh, including their very high voices, which mm. scientists have thought, you know, based on skeletal construction and, and how the the windpipe and the esophagus might have sat in their kind of their larynx, that their voices would be this extremely high pitched. Yeah. So the the Neanderthal identifies himself as Daz. He's says he followed one of Rose's people, uh, a man named Ka, into a strange tree back in his own time and by going through this tree he found himself in a place of manufactured things mm. and then he was uh, suddenly transported to the 21st century where he wandered into the uh, the fancy dress party <laughs> yes but also on, on the rare occasions uh, i have sampled um, south london nightlife i mean you do often need to have some form of id but uh, <laughs> you know maybe <laughs> maybe the door staff were new <laughs> <laughs> just looked at and thought yeah you look old enough and you probably not a cop will let you in um yeah so uh, Jack and the Doctor kind of managed to trace Daz's path uh, through time, and uh, they realise that uh, he has come from well, well BC, <laughs> like 29,000 BC. And uh, so the Doctor sort of makes a, a firm promise that he'll take Daz back home. But then when the TARDIS kind of takes off, uh, Daz starts to kind of disintegrate, um, forcing the Doctor to just kind of like abandon the flight. And what they realise is that Daz's body has just... It, it's it's just taken too much from the um, the bad time engine thing. Uh, and so basically, if they do try to kind of take him through time, it will rip him apart. I'm not sure how, but the TARDIS and even Jack's uh, wrist device, his time travel uh, arm thing, both of those provide it some sort of protection against the time winds that... Yeah allows uh people to travel multiple trips and without that if you're just using uh, this like um rip engine it's it's really like a a one-way trip you're not able to um travel back uh without fading away uh kind of like the fifth doctor in in the five doctors just kind of disappearing from existence but fortunately the doctors i think was able to like you said reverse it um, yes so daz didn't disintegrate yeah so you go back to 2006 bromley doctor orders jack to stay with him for a month or so to kind of help Daz get a good start in his life. Um, and, uh, so uh, the doctor arranges for kind of Jack and Daz to have a flat and uh, and a bank account accessible via a psychic credit card, <laughs> which sounds lovely. And there's a great exchange here where um, Jack sort of says, "Well, you know, why am I stuck with him?" And sort of and the doctor sort of basically kind of says that he'd much rather be travelling with Rose. <laughs> <to choose. laughs> I mean, Gareth Roberts had been reading some of the scripts. I mean, he he is able to get that dynamic pretty well spot on, I think, between Jack, the Doctor, and Rose. I feel like his characterization of those three, even though they only spend, what, two and a half episodes together Mm. on screen as this particular TARDIS team, Gareth Roberts does just a really good job of capturing their inner dynamic, their relationship. It just seems really spot on to me. Yeah. I I don't know to what extent this book was run past RTD, but certainly it was... was very clearly ran past the BBC office and there was a lot of hard work that sort of that, that meant this does feel like the people that you're watching on TV. That first year, especially with the the first three or six mm. Ninth Doctor novels, there was like really close integration with the TV series to the point where I think in Boomtown, Rose lists off a bunch of places she's mm. traveled with the Doctor and they happen to all be locations from the books. Mm. Well, also, I mean, if the TV series had been a flop then this would have been the continuation of it, wouldn't it? This would, yeah, mm. the books would have been the continuation. So they have to make sure that the books kind of are, are, are kind of like an accurate reflection and yeah, and the stuff that people would want to, to spend time in because, yeah, 
because like, you know David Tennant could have apparently expected to to be the Doctor only on Big Finish. <laughs> <laughs> so. oh. And we should mention too that um, throughout the rest of the book, we get little updates from Jack and Daz with. Yes. Uh, uh, dueling uh, journal entries. Yes, and we we will kind of come on to them, but they are brilliant because Daz tries to work out the world, but he works it out in a way that is different from what you'd expect, particularly because of you know, is because of the focus that he has on sort of like man-made things, because he realizes that um, you know that there are lots of things that are kind of made by man. Uh, he has difficulty understanding some concepts like money. The Jack and Daz diary entries are just beautiful i don't know whether um gareth roberts had read these or not but his description of the neanderthal culture and kind of their thought processes and how they're they're wired differently um from like a comprehension perspective a lot of that is very similar to there was a uh, book trilogy published in 2002 2003 that received a lot of praise in science fiction circles by robert j sawyer uh, it was a neanderthal uh, trilogy uh, and the books were called hominids humans and hybrid were the three titles and it's about a parallel earth where neanderthals developed to be the the main dominant culture as opposed to humans and mm. uh, a portal opens up between the neanderthal world and the and the human modern human world and you have these almost like an alien nation situation where you have mm. these two two cultures it's really fascinating but uh interesting yeah a lot of what is is in here feels similar to that but i mean that could also just be both robert sawyer and gareth roberts basing their fiction on where the research was at the time perhaps yeah. but um mm. it is it is kind of interesting to see that uh so so twenty eight thousand years prior back in daz's era uh, a team of researchers have been observing neanderthal culture for about 40 days it's similar to like a duck blind experiment like you might see in Star Trek Insurrection or um, uh, First Contact, that episode where you have more advanced culture observing the less advanced culture um, from yeah. hit, from hidden places. There's a couple, uh, Jacob and Lena, who have just received some bad news. Uh, Lena, who's already at this point nearly 400 years old, is about to suffer um, renal collapse and die. And she's told she has about three weeks to live. And you get kind of an understanding of how this group of scientists from the far future who've come back in time through a rip engine to, to this prehistoric time, you get a sense of, of how they operate. And they're very much a drugged, uh, heavily, <laughs> heavily medicated culture where mm. um, anytime they get what they're, what they call bad feelings or wrong feelings, they dial a certain code on their um, like drug dispensary pack, which is like a patch that they wear on their um, on, on their clothes, almost like a similar to like a nameplate. And you you dial in your your code and then hit enter, and then all of a sudden you know the bad feelings go away, and you get a dose of whatever drug you need at that time. It's both creepy, but it's also <laughs> uh, you can see where the culture might be you know going with this from today's perspective and it's it's scarily plausible isn't it yeah that's, that's a great great way to describe it even more so i'd say than nightmare of eden hmm. in terms of looking at drug use but you learn a little bit about these drug packs that they're that they're wearing and then um Jacob starts thinking about some of the things that have been kind of mysterious over the past 40 plus days where um some of his coworkers have failed to return when they've gone into the what's called the gray door in the research space so there's this extensive underground um research base that that everyone's living in it's like a like an underground village and uh their leader who's uh Chantel Osterberg who is the same little girl from the the first uh journal entry all all grown up she's the head of the project and she's been sending some of his co-workers down to this gray door and uh, they haven't returned and so that gives him anxiety and then rather than you know try and find an answer he just dials himself the proper drug combo and then forgets why his questions were were so important in the first place yeah a fun setup um, <laughs> and so the um, the tardis uh, meanwhile has kind of materialized in this beautiful prehistoric forest so and it's made very clear that you know, this is still bromley this is still the same area it's just you know obviously before 
all of the concrete and stuff arrived. The air's a lot fresher. Yes, yes, somewhat. So as the Doctor and Rose are kind of wandering around, uh, they um, they spot a chap wearing jeans and eating a baguette. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, is he's kind of like surprises either so uh, he runs off at incredible speed uh, and uh, as the um, doctor and rose uh, try to kind of like track him they discover the half-eaten corpse of a woolly mammoth and then the doctor notices that uh, some of the tooth marks are uh, uh, somewhat human-like and uh, they realise that whatever killed the mammoth is still near them. And then this kind of loud music blares out. And the Doctor and Rose kind of catch a glimpse of this kind of creature that's kind of running off. It seems to be kind of like a tall and gangly humanoid. And uh, the music is being played by two um, um, two guys, Tom and Jacob, who explain that they kind of use these, um, these music blasts to uh, frighten off uh, any of the indigenous animals whenever they visit the surface. Tom and Jacob uh, assume that the Doctor and Rose are here to take them home, but uh, other than that, they don't show any kind of particular interest in you know, why the Doctor and Rose are here or any emotion. Mm. And they're also um, very physically fit and mm. look, um, their appearance is described as like almost too perfect, like their faces are too symmetrical and mm. you know, no blemishes or no... They just they look like models or uh, movie stars, yeah. And their uh, their dress is described very much as like this is kind of where that Graham Williams era comes in because they're all wearing like uh, flared trousers and uh, tunics with like really large lapels, and uh, their hairstyle is described as you know that kind of seventies shaggy um, hmm. hairstyle. So it 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 feels very uh, almost. I was thinking like. You know, not quite Mavellans, but yeah. but th- but that sort of uh, that sort of aesthetic. It reminds me a bit of the uh, the end of the TV version of Hitchhikers, uh, when you have the uh, the kind of future humans crashing on Earth and kind of like having to kind of meet the Neanderthals uh, or kind of like the cave people uh, and uh, and kind of just helping kind of like build a new society. It feels very much like that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So Tom and Jacob lead the Doctor and Rose to a uh, tree, and this is, uh, they realize, is the same tree that Daz discovered because uh, there's like a secret uh, compartment that you press, and then the tree opens up to reveal a hydraulic lift, which takes them down to the um, underground village, which, by the way, the village is built entirely from wood. Um, and it's described as kind of uh, put together, almost like a shanty town meets like an IKEA village. It's a, <laughs> uh, just a mixture of different styles, and uh, there there are streets and homes and all that's underground. And uh, the Doctor and Rose encounter some of the other uh, inhabitants of the village who are um, just as kind of handsome and bland as Jacob and Tom. Uh, but they do run into T. P. Quilly who is a uh, the senior zoo tech, and he doesn't look like the others. He's looks like he's in his 50s. Uh, he's older, um, kind of heavy set, and he's uh, dressed in very anachronistic, kind of outlandish clothing. Uh, and he's considered a refuser, so he doesn't partake of the, the drugs that uh, everyone else seems to be using uh, kind of indiscriminately. And Quilly's the only one who's noticed really anything odds been going on and that you know they they should have wrapped up this observation like 10 days ago or so and they're farther into their their 40-day trip than than they thought and no one is really you know he's been raising concerns and everyone else just kind of shrugs them off and and dial more drugs the doctor asks rose to stick with quilly and find out what she can and so the doctor and rose split up and then jacob takes the doctor to chantel the leader who uh, then assigns uh, Linnea. She's the woman who only has two or three weeks left to live to kind of show them around. As they set off, the doctor notices that Lena appears exhausted, but she simply uh, uses the combos from her pack to give her a fresh burst of energy, and um, she's not concerned that she's about to die soon. 
the doctor tries to, to shock her out of this by having her have her explain everything to him as if he's a stranger or a newcomer with no idea of why they're there but she doesn't see anything strange about this at all and you know takes to it and explains you know that the village was set up as an experimental observation post and that Chantel has her intelligence has been enhanced to the 810 plus level which I don't know how uh smart that is but it sounds very smart <laughs> and uh they decide to they wanted to launch the experiment at the earliest point in human history uh when humans emerged as the sole kind of survivors of, of their genus and find out how the neanderthals uh were wiped out and then if this mission succeeds there are plans to create other observation posts in different uh historical areas too <laughs> So meanwhile, Chantal receives a message from from something called X01 uh, requesting food. And so uh, she sends uh, Tina, who's one of the project's typists. And uh, you know, I'm not too sure they need typists, but uh, hey-ho. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think a Gray Williams era expedition, though, would, would need typists. So it does make kind of sense. And so she sends Tina down to the Grey Door. So Tina's a little bit nervous because she thinks this isn't something that's particularly related to her job. And she's also um, worried that um, quite a few of her colleagues have uh, mysteriously disappeared after going off to the grey door. But uh, she kind of takes a a dose from her combo pack just to kind of calm her down and sort of just make her all nice and chill. And so she goes down the grey door and then something um, yanks her inside and bites her head off. (laughs) <laughs> yeah i was getting flashes of a stephen king's it <laughs> yeah it, that it's a brilliant sequence <laughs> and it kind of yeah that there is very much a dark humor in this book and, uh, and yes this sequence reminded me quite a bit of the setup in the gareth roberts story the lodger where you have mm. that apartment upstairs and it uses different ways to lure people up through the door it just it felt somewhat similar yeah like like that to me so now going back to uh early 21st century bromley Mm. uh jack's trying to teach daz how to fit in with the uh the humans and this we learn through journal entries from both daz and then also from captain jack um some of the concepts daz is able to grasp really easily he um loves snack foods and chips and and (laughs) cookies and uh he kind of works out that people of this time don't have to hunt for food so they've grown bored and invented many other things to occupy their time but in many ways uh daz's brain doesn't work quite the same way as a human's does uh he's not able to lie and he can't comprehend this concept of someone deliberately speaking untruths so Daz wants to fly around or notices, you know, airplanes flying around and wants to go in one. Um, mm. He was thinking they just kind of circle around Bromley and doesn't have a concept of like the world. So <laughs> Jack decides to take him out to New York City <laughs> and they go out to the nightclubs there where uh, Daz meets a woman who uh, likes guys that look like Daz, <laughs> who like the more <laughs> neanderthal looking uh guys but he uh kind of scares her off because he tells her that he tra- was you know transported through time and he's actually a neanderthal <laughs> uh, that was kind of a fun sequence there's also um like daz uh, gets the hang of television pretty quickly but he kind of believes that it's a way of finding out what the, all the various other tribes are up to and uh, so he starts watching um, repeats of uh, Are You Being Served, which uh, he thinks it's the, the Grace Brothers tribe, uh, and uh, that they're all trying to sell, but that there is a crowd also in their shop that is kind of like laughing at them and their mistakes, and the crowd are cruel because basically the Grace Brothers um, uh, people are so rubbish that they will fail to make money and then they will die. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so they'll be able to feed themselves it's like oh poor Daz yeah. <laughs> each tribe gets their own channel so yes yes yeah brilliant I, I, I just do love these these bits I mean I, I think I'd happily read a book of uh, Daz and Jack mm. mm-hmm. um, 
I think it might possibly run out of steam fairly quickly. <laughs> you might have to go off to some slightly strange places. They are just fantastic. And also how you know you see things from Daz's point of view, and then you see Jack just kind of go, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be funny if uh, Big Finish did like a Daz and Nimrod spinoff with uh, the Neanderthal <laughs> from uh, Ghost Light. Yes, yes, yeah. So kind of uh, <laughs> back in the past uh, in the kind of in the underground complex, um, uh, Quilly is noticing Rose's odd behaviour and kind of realises that uh, she's not really from his time period uh, so uh, uh, the doctor then kind of explains to Rose that the researchers are from a period known as the Great Retrenchment which is about 436,000 uh, AD um, and so when the earth has kind of like become collateral damage uh, in a war between sort of various intergalactic factors there was a kind of like a magnetic wave uh, sort of struck the earth which shut down all the digital technology and cut off the planet from its off-world colonies it's interesting that, that gareth roberts feels he has to do that because like because if there was like a major sun spot stormy thing i mean that could also cause some real problems for kind of like modern day tech uh, in real life for sure any um like emp sort of pulse from the from mm. the sun similar to like the carrington event in the 1800s if that were to happen today it for sure it would knock out all of our satellites and gps and mm. uh, we'd have to start over and anything not inside like a what's called a faraday cage mm. would basically all the electronics would fry so that's a it's like a real yeah. world concern but, but yeah. yeah he could have just had this set a thousand years into the future yeah even yeah. and not not involve the kind of the galactic stuff too but. yeah so uh, yeah so the human race has had to kind of go back to kind of like analog um mechanical tech and so they're kind of concentrating on biological and chemical sciences and uh, so and also they've figured out um, sort of anatomy so precisely that they can take a human body apart and put it back together with no ill effects. Uh, this may become important later. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and so most people from this era, apart from um, the refusers, uh, use chemical blockers to regulate their emotions. And so as a result, no one feels anxious or worried and nobody kind of like tries to kind of get anything more than what they already have. Yeah, that there, there are some some satirical um I don't know so much undertones or just overtones in this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's, it feels like that's another thing in common with like the Graham Williams era is the yeah. the social commentary in this is not unlike what you might find in like the Sunmakers or yeah. some of the other stories from that era. So the Doctor and Rose meet up again uh, after the Doctor encourages Ro one of the other things they've they've done away with is uh, the need to use the loo. Uh, so the <laughs> Rose tries a pill for that, <laughs> which is kind of a funny scene. The doctor uh, then asks Rose to go look around and try and find out more about the thing that had killed the mammoth on the surface. So Quilly suggests that she goes with one of the uh, scientists in the, and I use the term scientist loosely because these people are all kind of dumbed down. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they have a very limited grasp of understanding of, of human history in particular. And one of the things I liked about the Quilly character is how he gets so much wrong about uh, human history and, you mm -hmm. know, thinks a, uh, a washing machine that Rose wants to use uh, to clean some of her clothes um, is like a sacrifice to the goddess Vidal Sassoon or something to that. <laughs> yes, or Hot Point or something, yeah. yes. yeah. Rose goes to the surface and she goes with an observer named Reddy and Quilly takes the doctor to the rip engine, which is steam-powered and even more dangerous than the doctor had anticipated because not only is it a rip engine, but it's an analog rip engine. <laughs> it's also operating at full capacity and the power is being fed to another part of the compound. The doctor follows the pipes, and of course they lead to that gr that uh, mysterious gray door where um, mm. he and Quilly hear Tina apparently calling out for help. However, when they unlock the door with the sonic screwdriver, uh, something large, gangly, gray, and humanoid kicks it open uh, and throws out Tina's skeleton at them, and he's uh, mimicking her voice asking if the newcomers are humans. And realizing that the creature will eat them if it believes them to be inferior, 
the doctor uses his sonic screwdriver to knock uh, Quilly's hat off his head without touching it, uh, frightening the creature and making uh, the creature kind of retreat back behind the gray door again. The doctor and Quilly are able to lock the door, but then Chantel arrives with a remote control linked to uh, Jacob and Lena's combo packs, who are the uh, husband and wife couple uh, and Lena's... Uh, mm-hmm. Got the real few, issues. Yes. Yep, the drug packs or whatever give them the Jacob and Lena like a, a dosage, uh, turning them violent and angry. So they're they're kind of like uh, Chantel's mindless minions or soldiers, and mm-hmm. and then Chantel just has them forget that they even attack the doctor. It's quite scary the amount of control that uh, Chantel has in some books. It's it's not at all obvious who the villain is, but it's like from here from pretty much day one, it's like yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, Chantel's bad. Um, <laughs> so, um, so Reddy, we realise, is the uh, is the baguette eating chap uh, from earlier that um, the Doctor and Rose uh, saw when they first arrived, and uh, so he kind of explains uh, to Rose that so the reason why he ran is that he thought that they were from a nearby human tribe. And these uh, primitive humans uh, aren't able to control their emotions, and sometimes they act strangely and do this weird thing called violence. Reddy says that he wants to understand primitive behaviour, but doesn't quite know how to. So um, Rose um, sort of removes his uh, name tag and tells him that he needs to experience primitive emotions for himself. And uh, so Reddy is kind of surprised by this, but thinks, yeah, this makes sense. Uh, so he takes Rose to the Neanderthal camp, um, where they kind of like know him and accept him. And one of the girls there, um, called uh, Ka, regards him as her boyfriend. And so the um, thing I find interesting here is how they've been able to speak to each other mm. before the um, before the TARDIS arrived with its uh, translation circuits. But yeah, so Rose tells the Neanderthals that Daz is safe and well, um, but won't be able to return to them, and uh, and they they accept this, uh, and uh, and and they're just kind of kind of relieved. I do find it odd that they just kind of accept us at face value, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, and just as um, as Rose is kind of you know, is starting to relax a bit, humans from the nearby tribe attack the camp, and uh, and then when kind of Rose tries to intervene, the humans capture her and drag her back to their caves. Mm. And throughout all of this too, Reddy is mm. because Rose threw away his name tag, which has the the drug dial-up. Yeah, he's experiencing all sorts of different emotions that he's never experienced before throughout all of this. So we get his reactions to to everything as his head starts to clear too. Mm. Yeah, so you've got this interesting parallel between him learning about himself, and you have Daz learning about the world that he's in. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have uh, all these people exploring. In many ways. The doctor wakes up and he realizes that Chantel has given uh, Quilly a uh, drug combo pack and sends him back to work. And that she's also attached a pack to uh, the doctor and has been giving him large doses of drugs, uh, preventing him from feeling uh, anxious as she operates on him and studies his alien biology. There's this really creepy scene where the doctor talks about his heart and she says, which one, this one? And she she holds it up and shows it to him. Uh, (laughs) She's she's just uh, in there kind of tinkering around and... (laughs) Uh, yeah, she's she's brilliantly grim, isn't she? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh god. <laughs> she says that she knew that the Doctor and Rose were lying about kind of where they were from, and that they weren't from the same time period. But she wanted to let them wander around on their own, so she could observe them and find out what they were up to. She also talks about how she was the one who was responsible for sending Daz to a random place in time, just because he had broken into the underground complex by going through the tree uh, entrance. And so she ended up sending him to 2005 or 2006 Bromley and uh, just, you know, she was like, eh, don't care what happened to him. Uh, <laughs> at this point, the doctors learned too much about Chantel's uh, plans and the creature that she was creating was called a Hybractor. And there's more than just one. She's created uh, four of them. And uh, she finishes uh, kind of looking around the inside of the doctor and puts him back together again. And there's no scarring or anything like that, but he's very unsettled. And that, you know, his his ideas are still coming to him, but they're they're coming to him very slowly. Like he gets one idea every 30 seconds or so. He is able to get up after Chantel seals him back up, jumps off the operating table, uh, overpowers her, kind of fuses the wires, ties her up with, with the sonic screwdriver. 
and then he sets off to find Quilly. He does meet up with uh, Quilly, and, and they kind of run out of ideas for a while, and uh, he starts succumbing to the to the drug pack again. But then he sees uh, Rose's jacket, the one she was going to wash earlier, from all the uh, mammoth <laughs> stains, um, and that he realizes that he should go looking for Rose. Uh, the doctor does. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Tom, one, one of the kind of the handsome chaps from earlier, finds and uh, releases Chantal. And because of like the emotions that he's already had suppressed, um, he's not really kind of like asking too many questions when she um, orders him to accompany her to the grey door. And once uh, she releases the Hybractors, who eat Tom? Ah, oh, poor Tom. Mm. Uh, and so, uh, thanks to um, the doctor's interference, um, Chantal's having to kind of like move her plans forward. So she sends out um, sort of her creations to kind of just go and eat the humans, uh, though giving them very strict instructions to um, eat any of them apart from her and the doctor, because she figures the doctor could still be useful. Uh, and so, meanwhile, um, it occurs to the doctor that um, we need to remove his um, combo pack and Quilly's as well. And uh, and while searching for an antidote, he realizes that the refills have run out. Um, and so he infers from that that Chantal um, sort of no longer needs to kind of like keep her staff under control. And uh, then the um, the Hybractors arrive and start to eat the bewildered villagers. And some of these scenes are hilarious. Because the um, high brackets are coming up saying, excuse me, are you human? And start kind of like knocking on doors and saying, terribly sorry, are there are any humans in here. <laughs> um, it, it's so great. Williams, <laughs> it's very funny. Uh, so uh, the doctor slaps Quilly until he's angry enough to negate the effects of the combo pack and sends him to rescue the surviving villagers. Um, whilst he kind of goes up to the surface to uh, save the um, the native humans and the Neanderthals and, of course, Rose. And Rose, after being uh, kidnapped from the Neanderthal settlement, she wakes up to find herself now captive of the humans, the, the cave people of the time period, and they all think they had uh, rescued her from the Neanderthals. You get a lot of good commentary in this section and throughout the book about... Um, tribalism and hmm. you know in groups and out groups and why exactly humans think neanderthals are unlike them and and evil uh which which i appreciated hmm. uh that was there the matriarch of the human tribe uh her name is nan <laughs> uh she uh assumes that rose was sent to trade and trade with them and thinking that she might be from the nearby river tribe and she wants to know what uh what her skills are and that uh, Rose kind of realizes if, if she doesn't have anything to contribute to the group, you know, she might be in a very bad place with, with these people. So she offers to do all the cave people's uh, nails <laughs> and give them uh, <laughs> manicures and pedicures. And rather wonderfully, you have uh, men as well as women queuing up for, um, to have the nail treatments. Mm -hmm. I, thought, I thought it was really nice. And uh, Nan is impressed with Rose and her skills as a manicurist so she says thinks that she'll make a good addition to the tribe <laughs> and then she announces that rose is now betrothed to her uh grandson uh Tulloon, which rose is not at all excited about uh until she gets a look at Tulloon, she describes as the uh most fit and attractive boy she's ever seen this feels like rose isn't it <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i could see like barbara or someone winding up in the same sort of situation to just this this whole marriage uh by yeah this is true but i can't imagine barbara kind of gonna kind of go oh he's fit oh <laughs> yeah I, I might play along with this for sure yeah, yeah. <laughs> not that part <laughs> no. um even even so uh rose says you know marriage is probably a step too far and uh she must appease her god who she calls ooh la la <laughs> by uh, walking alone to face the sun before the wedding. Nan reluctantly agrees, but Taloon isn't fooled and follows Rose into the woods, genuinely upset uh, as to why she's rejecting him, because he's all set to be like the king of this tribe, and he wants to understand why she wouldn't want to marry him uh, when he always gets what he wants. Yeah, it's slightly creepy, that, particularly yeah. in the 2018 lens. Yeah. Uh, the doctor arrives and used his uh, psychic paper uh, to tame a wild horse <laughs> by convincing it that he is the god of horses. So, How many horses read? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's like, surely a psychic paper. 
I would have thought the psychic paper wouldn't work on something that wasn't used to the concept of writing. I mean, I think it has been used on some people that were illiterate. I seem to remember that happening in the TV show. I think it also but, um, can show images too, so maybe it was just yeah. uh, something in the horse's mind that could convince I Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> He's able to ride a horse horseback yes. from it and then he warns rose of the danger about the uh hybractors who were let loose but when they try to go back to warn the rest of the tribe nobody will listen to the doctor since he isn't one of them so frustrated by this rose gives in and agrees to marry Taloon because if she marries into the tribe then they said that they would heed her warning and and listen to the doctor because by extension he's like rose knows him so hmm. they would only extend this you know, extend the circle of, of who would be included in their tribe or group if Rose agrees to the marriage. Meanwhile, back in the future, in Bromley, uh, Daz is starting to get his head around the idea of lying. And so he's able to get a job as a construction worker by saying the reason why he looks slightly different from them is because he's from Romania. <laughs> but, yeah. Mm. <laughs> uh, so um, I, I, I kind of buy it as well. If you're given some sort of blasé um, uh, you know, every day, yeah, yeah, okay, I haven't been to Romania, maybe. So Daz is enjoying his new life um, because he's not having to kind of go out and hunt for food every day. And so, you know, it feels quite less relaxing. Uh, he's kind of going out clubbing um, with less violent altercations than before. And uh, here it gets a little bit odd because um, uh, Daz meets uh, a lady who he believes to be the most beautiful woman he's encountered so far a woman whose friends call her big fat Anne Marie and sort of Daz proposes to Anne Marie much to her father's delight as he never thought his daughter would find a match and so the implication well in fact, in fact I think it's actually stated you know, because of you know, her build she's kind of like regarded as being kind of like healthy and you know because she's able from mm. a Neanderthal point of view because she's been able to eat so much I don't know. I think that there's a bit of commentary in here about kind of like changing perceptions of beauty. Mm, but mm. also, though, there's the sometimes slightly uncomfortable attitudes that RTD sometimes showed to kind of like larger people where kind of like RTD could sometimes be really cruel in some of his writing. And you're just like, really? So, yeah, I, I found this bit odd. Yeah. I think. I, and I think it's helped a little bit by the way Gareth Roberts. Uh, you know the the criticism or, or the the people calling Anne Marie fat or, or heavy set are all all that is coming from her quote unquote friends yeah and and it's not coming to her at all from Jack or Daz or the narration yeah from from, from <laughs> that like perspective <laughs> yeah so I, I think that that's a way to kind of you know to yeah. to to include it without making it seem like they're endorsing that cruelty I guess yeah yeah. Um, so uh, yeah um, Jack's kind of uh, itching to move on but uh, he's also kind of relieved that he's managed to prevent uh, Daz from hooking up with another woman that they met briefly at a nightclub Rosa's mum I wonder whether originally this was going to be Mickey Mm. rather than Jack Mm. it would make a lot more sense because also, because like Mickey is more of a supporting character. Because like you know, Jack doesn't really have much to do with the main strand of, the, of, of, of this book. Mm-hmm. It would have made more sense for this to be Mickey. Back in the uh, underground complex in the past, Quilly's trying to explain the situation to the other uh, time travelers, how much in danger they are, and he's trying to get as many of them as possible to evacuate, you know, and go up the lift and out of the tree. But the only villagers he's able to convince is. Uh, Lena, who has the uh, the terminal diagnosis, uh, because her combo packs already run out, and she's beginning to become frightened. And then her husband Jacob uh, also accompanies uh, her and Quilly to the lift. And moments later, the Hybractors arrive to that section of the village and continue to wipe out all the other villagers who are being eaten. And uh, those three are the only three that uh, manage to escape to the surface, but one of the Hybractors follows them up the lift shaft. Rose is officially wed to Tillon, thus becoming Rose Galapica Maliak. <laughs> Uh, yeah i'm not going to try to pronounce that again um but so anyway so the tribe um now listens to her warning 
and so they flee to safety in their caves before the Hybractors arrive. Uh, all apart from Rose herself, who kind of rides off with the Doctor to kind of warn the Neanderthals. Um, and so Tillon, uh, furious by all of this, kind of attacks the Doctor and is accusing him of stealing his wife. And uh, the Doctor overpowers him and uh, flees with Rose on his on the horse that believes him to be a god. Uh, they now realise, the Doctor and Rose, that uh, the creature that killed the mammoth was a Hybractor um, that Chantal had kind of let out to try to kind of get it acclimatised. But uh, they don't know why she's kind of breeding these creatures. And uh, then they arrive at the Neanderthal camp too late, and uh, the Hybraxes have kind of been there, and they've eaten most of the Neanderthals, leaving only a few alive to lure the Doctor and Rose into a trap. And it's quite sad because it's made very well. It's it's somewhat implied here that sort of um, that Reddy and Carr have probably died. It, it, it's quite shocking because uh, there are piles of kind of like neatly sort of chewed bones and. Uh, yeah, it's very grim. Uh, and uh, Chantal uh, is there and she kind of stuns them into submission um, and uh, orders the, uh, the Hybractors to spare Rose unless the Doctor refuses to cooperate. Mm. And here we get another kind of interesting commentary about the violence in, in the Neanderthal village. And uh, I think Chantal mentions that if it wasn't her and her Hybractors, the Neanderthals would have met the same fate from the humans of the time anyway. It's really sad, too, because you kind of realize that the Neanderthals are doomed no matter what, even though they're pretty peaceful and non-aggressive and non-violent. So back in the in the uh, underground complex, the Chantal takes the Doctor and Rose back down there, and she reveals some of her plan uh, in that Doctor Who fourth episode of a series sort of, <laughs> sort of way. Chantal had concluded that Homo sapiens are perfectly adapted for survival, as primitive hunters in a cold climate. However, when the Ice Age ended, humanity retained its hardwired aggression and competitive nature and spread across the world like a plague. Chantel then became director of the project by killing off her rivals who might have also headed up the project. And once she had returned to the dawn of human history with the underground complex, she started building an upgraded form of humanity using the extra energy from the rip engine to accelerate their growth. And once the Hybractors have been released, they're going to devour all other species and replacing humanity and creating a new utopia in Chantel's image. And to ensure that her project would succeed, she had uh, surgically removed her empathy along with uh, the other humans. So the doctor's unable to convince her that what she's doing is wrong. And also, back when Chantel had been drugging him with a combo pack, he had told her about the TARDIS. She wants to now access the TARDIS to, you know, spread her vision of quote-unquote utopia all across time and space, not just uh, limiting it to Earth. And uh, the doctor refuses to help her until uh, Chantel um, reveals that she surgically removed Rose's head from her body. Um, and it's Rose doesn't realize this at first. Um, um, but I mean, she's she's still alive. Yeah, her head is on top of a table. So the the doctor is reluctantly preparing to let Chantal into the TARDIS. But when Rose tries to step forward to stop her, a cabinet on the other side of the room kind of clatters. And uh, the doctor realizes that Rose is able to control the lower half of the body, even though you know, her head's not attached to it. It's not made at all clear how this is working. <laughs> <laughs> Some sort of Wi-Fi signal. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. This reminded me quite a bit of um, both Mars Attacks, that movie mm. where you have the heads being swapped, sort of thing, and then yeah. also uh, an old Mystery Science Theater three thousand called The Brain Who Wouldn't Die, which was a uh, Mike Nelson's first uh, experiment on the satellite of love and the woman on, on the mm. table talking with her body elsewhere. It's just, it's, it's one of those classic, super over the top, campy yeah. 1950s throwbacks. It's also a bit like Return to Oz as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. I didn't even think about that one, but for sure. Yeah. The witch in that. But yeah, so, uh, so the, the Doctor distracts Chantel um, by talking about the intricate technology in the TARDIS's lock. And Rose, uh, she's now kind of getting able to shock as to what's happened to her and kind of steps out of the lock. Uh, and that's just enough for Chantel to be distracted. And so the Doctor's able to kind of like overpower her. 
and the doctor sort of says rather sweetly that Rose's trust in him is proof that evolution sometimes gets it right and he then slaps this combo pack onto Chantal's chest and uh, gives her this dose of emotions or suppressants to the fact that she's completely unconcerned about the fact that she's just been defeated by the doctor Hmm. i wonder because i would think russell t davies probably read all these novel Hmm. at least the first year i know gary russell was brought on i think starting in year two to kind of maintain continuity with all the different spin-off novels and stuff but i can't help but wonder if the russell t davies story uh gridlock from early season three if he was influenced by this because there you have you know the different drug stands or the, mm. the the different shop stands open up and you know they're selling things like happiness and yeah melancholy and yeah it, yeah I, I wonder if there was maybe some influence there or not mm-hmm. the doctor then uses the equipment in the laboratory to force cultivate a particular gene slice it into some gut bacteria like a gun that dispenses the uh the concoction um and he assures rose that he'll return for her uh, both parts of her <laughs> um, <laughs> up on the surface the doctor takes his uh, spray gun and spreads this compound quickly and it has an interesting effect one of the hybractors catches Tillon uh, searching for Rose another hybractor finds Quilly cowering with Jacob and Lena and a third finds its way into the laboratory and advances on Rose but uh, Rose picks up her head from the table points it at the hybractor and spits out a sheet of fiery acid, which blows its head off, as do uh, Quilly and Taloon on the surface all at the same time. It's very convenient, that, isn't it? Yeah. That then, <laughs> yeah. That, that, that they're not just kind of... Um, they know just, what to just, do, yeah. Well, yeah, they don't accidentally burn themselves or somebody else. Yeah, spitting fire. <laughs> yes. Three out of the four of the hybractors are killed, um, mm. because of this so um the doctor returns to the laboratory and uh, assures rose that this kind of um, this ability to belch fire is going to kind of fade away within minutes but meanwhile chantal's kind of wandered off when she's got this vague sense that her plans failed and so um, she's kind of thinking that maybe she should use the rip engine to kind of go to 21st century and start afresh uh, and so the doctor and rose arrive too late um, but uh, as she steps into the time field, um, she's kind of torn apart, just as Daz nearly was earlier. So the Doctor, his fears have now been proven right that the rip engine is becoming unstable. And uh, the Doctor and Rose retreat to the TARDIS and escape moments before the rip engine explodes, which wipes out the underground complex. However, Rose's head is still separated from her body, and the one person that knew how to fix it, Chantal, is dead. I wonder how she's going to get out of that one. <laughs> <laughs> and there's this kind of strange, like Perry-like vibe, because um, it, it does make me think of like Benders on Varos when um, you know Perry becomes a bird for um, reasons that are you know, very obvious, uh, and uh, it just conjured back memories, <laughs> memories of that of kind of like unnecessary experiments on companions. Yeah. The Doctor then materializes on the surface. The TARDIS had been brought to the underground complex earlier. And uh, he meets up with Tillon, who's found Quilly, Jacob, and Lena. And when the Doctor emerges from the TARDIS, uh, Tillon, who's uh, Rose's uh, husband, spits at him. But fortunately, his ability to spit fiery stomach acids worn off. So he just spits at the doctor and he runs away fleeing in terror when uh, the headless Rose steps out of the TARDIS carrying her head with her. Well, it's a fair reaction, isn't it? I mean, even after a short romance, you'd be kind of like, okay, yeah, this is weird. (laughs) The last of the remaining Hybractors arrives, uh, but the doctor informs it that Chantel died after passing on instructions that the Hybractor is no longer allowed to eat human beings. <laughs> Since the uh, Hybractor is still relatively young and was already told not to eat the doctor, and similar to Daz, uh, doesn't have any understanding of the concept of lying, um, it accepts the doctor's claim and agrees to live in peace with the human beings and only eat um, other animals, not uh, humans or Neanderthals. Lena then reveals that, um, that conveniently uh, she's got knowledge to reattach Rose's head. 
Um, and so she does so. And then she collapses and dies. So uh, that was very good timing. Um, <laughs> uh, so Jacob uh, begs the doctor to save her life, but uh, but there's nothing that he can do. Uh, so um, Quilly shows genuine sympathy for Jacob's loss um, instead of the kind of like the overblown emotions he's shown before. And uh, as he comforts Jacob, uh, he accepts as well the doctor's claim that they'll be unable to return home and that they're going to have to make a new life for themselves with the cave people. And, uh, the doctor and Rose return to 2005 to pick up Jack, uh, but they're able to kind of sit in on uh, Daz's wedding to, um, to Anne-Marie. Uh, and uh, speaking of weddings, back in the past, Quilly marries Nan, so their two tribes may be united. And uh, then when he realised that some of the Neanderthals had survived a Hybractor attack, including Carr and Redding, uh, Reddy, pardon me, uh, he asks Nan to accept them into the tribe as well. Nan agrees, albeit reluctantly, thus making the human race just a little bit more civilised. Hmm. And uh, there ends the book on that rather that rather lovely note of kind of you know integration and people coming together mm-hmm. um, which uh, seems something sadly missing from the <laughs> popular discourse <laughs> yeah so whilst this was a book of 2005 it, it definitely I think speaks to 2018 mm-hmm. despite its um, flip phones and various other bits of uh, 2005 culture yeah so what do you reckon? I really, really enjoyed this one. Um, it was easy to read. Mm. Um, it was a quick read. I, I think I read it in, in two sittings. It was. Um, yes. It had that balance that I really like from books where you get the plot, but it's not just the plot. You get characterization. You get moments of kind of slice of life. It, it's weird because this book contains a lot of my favorite like sci-fi elements. <laughs> like, <laughs> I like learning about neanderthals i like um stories where there's like a fish out of water like my my two favorite torchwood episodes are the the one with the uh the three people coming you know from the 1940s that have to resettle Mm. in modern time and then also the one where um tosh is unfreezing the guy and he experiences like a a day every year sort of Mm. thing Yes, both beautiful episodes. Yeah, and yeah. and really that you know person out of time element, which is really strong here. I also really liked how 1970s this felt in terms of the <laughs> the Graham Williams era and the uh, the the humans from the future, and just that they were you know they all had huge name badges and they had their flared trousers and they were using uh, pneumatic tubes. <laughs> To, to to communicate throughout the underground complex, the technology just felt so seventies. Hmm. I also like how the story matches this point on television. So, you know, you don't have any mentions of Gallifrey by name, even though no. the Doctor alludes. So it's it's very much kind of it meshes up nicely with where the story was at the time on the television screen too. What did uh What did you think of it? Um. Yeah. I. I... I enjoyed it. I mean, yeah, it very much feels of the era um, um, which it's kind of written. Even though, say, so, yes, it feels very Graham Williamsy, but also you can you can easily imagine the Hybractors being kind of um, you know being done in the two thousand five era of the show. Um, yeah, it wouldn't it wouldn't require a loss of you know, a loss of change. Possibly they wouldn't have to trip to New York on mm-hmm. <laughs> the BBC budget. I I have the kind of like the extra benefit of like when the Doctor says that he goes to the Gap in Croydon to kind of like to buy most of his outfits. I'm like yeah, I've been there. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so, mm. and also it explains away his his his, his costume for, um, uh, in that incarnation because that does feel like something that you know someone's just gone to the Gap and bought. It it's great. I, I really did love this. Um, and and yes, um, the you know, the writing's very kind of clear. Whilst it's it's probably from a writing point of view, it's aimed at a slightly younger audience than the new adventures and uh and the, the kind of like the eighth doctor books it's still you've got these kind of you know, messages of kind of tolerance mm. uh that that's kind of like coming through which i don't know if i actually kind of like expected that to kind of come through quite as strongly it's rather lovely 
and also I mean because apparently it was on the back of this book that uh, Gareth Roberts was um, was asked to um, to write the Shakespeare code mm. and you can kind of see why because I mean this this does feel like it's very much of a of a piece of the um you know, with the tv show mm-hmm. um and 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 kind of makes yeah make, make makes me a bit sad that we'll um we will we'll most likely never ever have a big finish series of um of the ninth doctor jack and uh, and rose yeah. i'll never say never but yeah i well. agree with you <laughs> 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 Yeah. Yes, I, I remember yeah. in in ninety nine when Gary Russell launched the the big finish line at Convergence. He said, "You know, we're never going to be able to get Paul McGann, so don't even ask." Yeah, but Paul but, McGann's not been quite as negative yeah, about his true. experience. True. <laughs> <laughs> Because um, I mean, Eccleston's been making much stuff in the press over here about the fact that um, he's recently been allowed back on the BBC, uh, and uh, he feels that the BBC had kind of sort of chucked him out. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I we'll, 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 we'll never see him in anything Doctor Who related. I think. Hmm. How would you rate this particular story? How would I rate this? Yeah, um, I, 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 I think it's an eight. Uh, yeah. I, I do. I mean, there's you got you've got some lovely comedy. I mean, there's. I think part of it is I mean it, it's quite light in places, even though it does touch upon you know, you know these important messages of kind of you know of you know, everybody working together and you know, integration and um do to my heart but um yeah, I think if it was a stronger plot, I think I might have kind of given it a nine, but yeah, I mean, it's the stuff of Jack and Daz I mean, I mean okay, if you've listened to this far and you've not read it, still go and read the book because it the, the Jack and Daz stuff is just yeah, it's worth your kind of four pounds or however much the Kindle is alone. And they, it's brilliant, and we've not really gone into sort of much of the detail of of of, of their diary entries, including uh, when the cable or the Sky TV guy comes to to install the. <laughs> The, the television and and Jack and the TV tech decide to go off for a walk <laughs> together <laughs> and leave Daz alone for a while. <laughs> yeah, there's all yeah. sorts of fun moments in in this book, and the, their whole trip to New York City is is hilarious. And mm. like I was saying earlier, so many of the minor characters, you know, just in a sentence or two, you get a strong sense of who they are. Like mm. just the just the opening character, not you know, the nurses and the hospital the the opening people at the costume party uh mm. you know the roman and the in the astronaut and yeah. getting the wrong caveman i mean you just you get such a clear sense of their character but maybe not so much in the prehistoric stuff though hmm. um, but because their their emotions have all been subdued I, I think that's probably got a large part to it mm-hmm. um because i mean because that's the thing i mean i think gareth roberts is brilliant at slice of life stuff um, you know, as shown by you know, the lodger and the caretaker, I think if we, if the plot had allowed us to kind of get more of a taste of some of the characters in the prehistoric time, then I might have kind of gone a little bit higher on mm. my grade. But uh, but yeah, what 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 do you reckon? Um, you for me, it's it's a nine, uh, okay. and it was so close to being a ten. <laughs> 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 like even even up till the final. 10 or 15 pages or so I was thinking is you know is this going to be my first 10 but uh a couple of I I think um it was really the the whole fire belching part Mm. where that seemed like such a rushed resolution and and just so kind of fantastical that you say that you say that it's very RTD though isn't it it is, yeah. But and it, it, to me, it was just like one absurdity too far. Like I, if yeah. they had left it with Rose, you know, with with the head, you know, talking and you know going to that, it would just push the envelope that little bit too far for me. And then mm. um, some of the ridiculousness of the the whole marriage subplot felt like Rose got hit on a few too many times by too many different characters in this book. But I mean, it, it was almost a ten for me. It really was. But. Mm. Um, I, I I would give it a nine. Some of the kind of fun continuity references that are that are in this book too. Um, the fast return switch gets mm-hmm. gets used. Uh, I think Jack is wearing Ben's sailor suit for much of this book. Yes, could well be, couldn't he? Yes, yeah. And hey, you get a reference to Farscape <laughs> <laughs> in the book too. Um, so yeah, I, I just I really really enjoyed it. Like I said earlier, mm. it, it had a, all of my 
favorite elements. You've got duck blinds, hidden underground cities, Neanderthals, kind of the intermittent j- journal entries that change up the narrative a little bit. Yeah. Um, I love love it when there are like time archaeologists that get get stuff wrong, like <laughs> like you had with the Quilly character. Yeah. Um, it was just really well paced, very breezy, but there were moments of really profound depth in it. Mm. Like I was saying, it has a lot to say about tribalism and kind of the modern forms that that takes today. So highly recommended. Yeah, I was half expecting a reference to the Tribe of Gum, um, mm. uh, which um, is is almost kind of like conspicuous by its absence. It's like because we 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 don't know where the Tribe of Gum are. They could be in Bromley. Yeah, they could be, and and Ka could be. Isn't there a Ka in Tribe of Gum too? Yeah, yeah, Maybe. I think so. But uh, yeah, the, the doctor mentions that he's encountered Neanderthals before. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, that could be referring to Ghost Light or something else. I was a yeah. little surprised too that they didn't get a direct reference. But again, just just a minor criticism, yeah. I think, of of a overall a pretty strong and solid work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's good fun. Um, so, so, so should we um, go into any feedback? Uh, did not check <laughs> before. Let me pull up the. Uh, we have more things on iTunes. Oh, do we? Breaking news. Yes, yes. Ooh. So we've not heard from Marge five seven one seven before. So she said, um, "Great podcast that makes me think about what the doctor's up to between his televised adventures." Uh, mm. Fun host with good rapport too. That's nice. It's lovely. Uh, so uh, yes, we have one from Jen, an iTunes review from January, and she writes, "Great podcast." Mm-hmm. That's all. I think we've heard from Jen or Jennifer, haven't we? Um, I think we got an email from her last month, yes. Yeah, I think an email, yeah. yeah. But it looks like she left a review in January, too, so that's cool. cool. Okay, cool. We do not have any emails this month. Oh, okay. Uh, if you would like to send us an email, feel free to email us at andwbcpodcast at gmail.com, and we'll be sure to read your feedback in a future episode. If you have comments on Only Human, this month's book, or last month's Ten Little Aliens, or anything you want to talk about, feel free to email us. Yeah, or any suggestions of, uh, of, of anything that you would like us to, um, you know, to look into, that'd be great. On the Facebook uh, side, we had a um, we had a lovely lovely review from uh, Joe Candora, um, which he, he he said some very kind things about us, which was always good to hear. Uh, and uh, he also um, asked if we were thinking of doing any kind of spin offs. I think probably not just yet um, of kind of going into the spin off media, but uh, at some point, I think. We probably will, but but might kind of I say not in the immediate future. Yeah, there's just so many ranges and uh, formats of uh, we we still haven't even done like a any of the Telos novellas or yeah. any of the targets or any of the um... Fifth Doctor <laughs> <laughs> or Sixth Doctor. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, I, I think we're primarily you know a Doctor Who podcast, and I think well, it might be interesting to you know someday dip our toes in in fact paradox or mm, some of the benny, benny adventures yeah. uh certainly but yeah i want to i think pick something that still has some sort of obvious tie-in to doctor who even if the doctor's not in it i mean we've done and we may do in the future you know some doctor light books mm. uh where he's not in it that much so we, we did that with uh face of the enemy yes but who knows mm. someday we, may, we <laughs> might do that <laughs> Yes, who knows? So, speaking of book selections, uh, mm. Chris, what are we reading uh, next month? Is it something fifth or sixth Doctor related, or is it something else entirely? So, it is something that related to the sixth Doctor. So, when I think of the sixth Doctor in the spin off media, I think of Big Finish, I think of some of, the, some of the novels, but I primarily think of him in the comics. And if you're going to be doing the sixth Doctor in the comics, what, where's the best place to start? Let's start with Voyager. Mm. So uh, we're we're going to be doing uh, Voyager next month. We'll be we'll be doing the um, the Panini edition. Marvel did a a graphic novel collection in uh, in eighty nine um, that sort of did just Voyager, whereas this does have some additional comics in there as well. But yeah, so uh, it'll be uh, John Ridgway and uh, Steve Parkhouse uh, and Frobisher the Penguin. <laughs> uh, so yeah, the, the Sixth Doctor and Frobisher might be my favourite Sixth Doctor 
Todd Estate. Mm. I'm excited to uh, to read it, and if going with the Panini version, all mm. of the Six Doctors comics are essentially collected into two volumes. So yes, if we ever do the second volume, we will have done all of uh, his era comic wise. Yeah, and uh, that second volume has Grant Morrison written stuff in it, which is uh, which interestingly ties into um, uh, the most recent uh, Capaldi season. Which is mm. all I'm going to say on that, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but clearly Moffat had read it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I look forward to reading that someday as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So next month we're going to be reading the Panini collection uh, for Voyager. Yeah, it's excellent. Gonna, it's going to be good fun. Until next month, I've been Matt in Minnesota. Chris, no problem. <laughs> Happy reading. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the all new adventures of the doctor who book club podcast special thanks to george c music for use of their song doctor who theme swing jazz version you can follow us on twitter at a n d w b c podcast and like us on facebook you can support the show by leaving us a rating and review on itunes you can contact the show by emailing your thoughts to a n d w b c podcast at gmail.com and until next month happy reading You were very brave. I decided not to try to reinstall Call Recorder. But it was saying, oh, I want to do an update. It's like, no. <laughs> no, I'll do that in about two hours or so. <laughs> uh, just before I met Stephen Hawking, I'd shaken the hand of Tony Blair, not realising all of the uh, the horrors that he would inflict on the country. <laughs> it was before the Iraq War and such like that. But yeah, I don't know if I'd shake your hand now, mate. I was young and the country was still besotted with him. Um, so. there's a reference to uh daz when he's on the airplane on on the yeah. way to new york city yeah playing the the game f-zero which is a <laughs> super nintendo game and i right. i spent an inordinate amount of time trying to figure out which version of the game he was playing and how <laughs> came down to uh I think he was playing it on a uh, Nintendo uh, DS, which had just come out at the time, and he was yeah. playing the F Zero Maximum Velocity Game Boy Advance game from 2001, <laughs> which is the most recent one that would have been compatible. So that yeah. was that was my big continuity conundrum, yeah. my, my Nintendo fanboy in in me thinking, uh, what version yeah. of the game is he playing? Yeah, just because of nightclubs in South London. Um, is, or just general, <laughs> is it a general. specialist subject? <laughs> it's not a specialist subject, but yeah. Nightlife of South London is something that's... Try and get this posted uh, no later than the 15th, hopefully. Yes, yes. Yeah, so I can I can listen to it whilst I'm doing my marathon. Because that is the 15th. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> so that's your challenge. <laughs> so so uh, okay. I, I can li- listen to myself in a very weird, egotistical way. Um, <laughs> I will uh, endeavor to make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.